What now for North Korea? Donald Trump cancels much-awaited talks with Kim Jong-un, but neither are ruling out a change of mind sometime in the future. So what happens to the North's nuclear weapons now? This is Inside Story. And welcome to the program. I'm Elizabeth Peranum. Shocking, perplexing and unexpected, just some of the reactions to Donald Trump cancelling his highly anticipated summit with Kim Jong-un in Singapore next month. The North said Trump's decision was extremely regrettable, a sentiment echoed worldwide as a missed opportunity for peace. The US president called it a sad moment of history and the White House blamed North Korea's trail of broken promises. In a letter to Kim, Trump said, Sadly, based on the tremendous anger and open hostility displayed in your most recent statement, I feel it's inappropriate at this time to have this long-planned meeting. You talk about your nuclear capabilities, but ours are so massive and powerful that I pray to God they'll never have to be used. Well, despite Trump's surprise announcement, North Korea is not giving up hope that talks will eventually happen. The North's vice foreign minister said they regretted Trump's decision, but that they're willing to meet any time to resolve any issues. He also praised Trump for his bold decision to engage with the North recently. Now, the Korean War in the 1950s left a long legacy of distrust between implacable enemies, and the United States, Japan and other regional neighbours felt increasingly threatened by nuclear bomb tests and the launching of more than a dozen long-range ballistic missiles last year. Trump called Kim the rocket man on a suicide mission. Kim accused Trump of being mentally deranged and hit out at military exercises, which he said threatened invasion. But diplomatic progress had been made since. Last month, Mike Pompeo became only the second U.S. Secretary of State to meet a North Korean leader. Trump welcomed home three Americans freed from jail as a goodwill gesture by North Korea. Also last month, the leaders of the North and South took historic steps. During their unprecedented meeting in the demilitarized zone, both committed to finally signing a peace treaty to formally end the Korean War. And for his first foreign trip, Kim went to China to see his ally, President Xi Jinping. Well, let's now get the thoughts of our guests. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Mintaro Oba, former U.S. diplomat and career desk officer. In Norwich, Ra Mason, lecturer at University of East Anglia. Ra is also author of Japan's Relations with North Korea and Recalibration of Risk. And on Skype from Seoul is Si Wung Koo, publisher of Korea Exposé. He writes about Korean politics and current affairs. A very warm welcome to all of you. Mr. Uber, President Trump has said that this is a loss for North Korea and for the world, but are you surprised? Well, I'm not surprised that President Trump has been as reactive about canceling the summit as he was about initiating or responding to its invitation in the, in the first place. Um, I am a bit surprised that, uh, that he wasn't invested enough to... Uh, to continue with it beyond this point. Mr. Ku, why do you think the U.S. president really cancelled the summit? Well, there were indications that North Korea and the United States had fundamental differences when it came to how they envisioned the denuclearization process. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about how the uh, United States might want to duplicate the so-called Libya model in dismantling the nuclear program in North Korea which meant that North Korea would have to make significant concessions before there can be any kind of rewards. And then we have seen that North Korea certainly had no interest in going along with this maneuver. So I think um, if you were to ask a lot of commentators here in South Korea, they will tell you that the U.S. government might simply have come to the realization that they just don't have enough time before this Singapore summit to clarify all the details, work out all the differences. So it might just be better to cancel it at this point in time and try to have another one scheduled in the near future. Mr. Mason, Donald Trump has blamed uh, North Korea's hostile rhetoric for cancelling the summit, and American officials have also um, pointed out that North Korean officials missed uh, meetings to prepare for the summit, that they weren't answering their phones. Was North Korea committed to the summit? 
Yes, I think North Korea was committed to the summit, but I think there's, in one sense, a cultural difference here and also a tactical difference. North Korea certainly would like and has for a long time wanted to draw the United States into a direct dialogue. Um, but the means by which they do that, if you like, the way in which the goalposts are set and the way, we, the way in which the protocol is, is followed is quite different on both sides. And so there's a game of kind of one-upmanship, but also of demonstrating who is able to call the shots here. And I think some of the way in which this is broken down is due to a misunderstanding by, by which that should, or the way in which that should proceed. Mr. Ober, do you think that um, how much of this misunderstanding might come from different voices in the U.S. administration? And is, does the U.S. administration have a unified um, diplomatic strategy for dealing with North Korea, do you think? Well, I'm doubtful that the United States has any real coherent strategy when it comes to North Korea at all. Um, and I think that um, in National Security Advisor John Bolton, President Trump has someone who's very much an ideological hardliner who is skeptical about diplomacy and this summit from the start. And in Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, he also has someone who's conservative, but his outlook is somewhat different. He, his perspective is just generating successes for the president. Mr. Mason, how does the U.S. administration, if there are if there's any chance that a summit can actually take place again, as uh, both the U.S. and North Koreans have said they hope will happen, how does the U.S. administration go about reconciling these, you know, real differences coming from within? Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is an important question. Um, I think the next move in terms of moving back towards dialogue would certainly be for Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, perhaps to make um, another visit to North Korea. There might need to be mediation from China as well. China will be a key player in this. And so the U.S. will need to find a way to present itself which, which avoids losing political capital at home. In other words, sustains this idea of legitimacy, of genuinely moving towards dialogue, of engaging in North Korea, but at the same time has to show some kind of reconciliation or some kind of move back towards the North Koreans. Um, otherwise, the North Koreans will not be able to uh, project this image of legitimacy to their own people and also be able to kind of move the relationship with China and the United States forward. Well, we have actually heard from the uh, Chinese Foreign Ministry reaction to the cancellation of the summit. So let's just uh, listen in. As a party that's concerned about the nuclear issue on the Korean Peninsula, we think that a meeting between the US and North Korean leaders would have a pivotal role in promoting the denuclearization process. In the present situation, we really hope that the United States and North Korea can cherish the recent positive progress, exercise patience, show goodwill and meet each other halfway, and can continue to be dedicated to solving each other's concerns through talks and to work together to promote the denuclearization process. Process. Mr. Ku, China is saying that they are hopeful that a summit can still take place, that the progress that's been made in the last few weeks and months can be built upon. What role do you see China playing now? Well, at this point in time, China really remains one very strong backer of North Korea. This is the country that Kim Jong-un chose to visit as the destination of his first ever state visit since taking power. And China has shown tremendous support for the North Korean regime throughout this process, despite the fact that it has had some very difficult relationship with Kim Jong-un because Kim Jong-un was proceeding with the nuclear program. Um, South Korean government certainly has indicated that it sees China very much as a partner in bringing about dialogue. And to some extent, China has been a much more friendly country to South Korea's approach to dealing with denuclearization than the United States. Mr. Mason, do you think that China, how willing do you think China is to play a role um, in this process now, given that President Trump seemed to point the finger at China a few days ago when the North um, started being a little bit hesitant to go ahead with the summit? Yeah, I mean, certainly there, there's a, I'm sure there's a degree of irritation um, from the Chinese side towards the, the attitude, if you like, or at least the public attitude of the United States administration. But overall, I think the Chinese will welcome the opportunity to continue to play a mediating role because all of this is playing into a much broader strategic um, 
long-term game, if you like, of the Chinese dominate, beginning to dominate if you, the, the soft power arena. And what I mean by that is to say that China has already been able to take the lead on things like climate change, on military de-escalation in certain other areas. And so a role that was previously played by the United States of the kind of international statesman or the international police force has begun to shift slightly towards Beijing. And this presents a positive image for of China to the world and presents the image of China as a responsible player, both regionally and globally. And that's something that Beijing seeks to improve and to continue. So I think they will they will welcome this as an as an opportunity rather than as a, as a threat or a challenge. And Mr. Oba, what about Japan's role in all of this? Whereas China and South Korea have expressed disappointment, Japan has always been um, much warier about um, this process with North Korea. Well, Japan has had a very tough time staying relevant in North Korea for years, really, because it, uh, it's not South Korea, it's not one of the two Koreas, and it doesn't have the leverage or the clout that China uh, or the United States does. Um, so Japan's interest is really in staying relevant in the North Korea policy game. And in a way, it benefits when uh, tensions are higher between the United States and North Korea because um, it has been an advocate of the pressure campaign and it is a friend to the hardliners in the administration. Mr. Ku, how is Seoul looking on at what's happened? President Moon Jae-in said that um, he was perplexed. But what does the cancellation of the summit, if anything, mean for North-South relations? Well, that's a good question. Um, there has been a statement coming out of the presidential Blue House today that despite this uh, enormous setback, South Korea has continued to try and get these important parties to the peace process um, talking. At the same time, the government will continue to remain committed to improving relations with North Korea, which, um, according to its own vision, was supposed to include um, significant economic aspects as well. The question, though, at this juncture is whether any of this is really going to be especially feasible when everybody is aware that the ultimate goal North Korea wants is to be taken seriously as a state actor and to rejoin the international community, to gain that legitimacy that it's been craving for a very long time, and above all, to undo the kind of international sanctions that have really been keeping it isolated for a very long time. These are things that South Korea cannot address alone, and there's really a limit to what South Korea can do for North Korea without having the bigger picture sorted out. And Mr. Mason, you know, could the bigger picture be sorted out without the kind of low-level diplomacy that many have said has been missing in this process? And if so, could the cancellation of the summit actually be a good thing where then you have the lower level diplomacy and diplomats um, preparing for a summit. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly a possibility. I think there's perhaps more going on than has been publicly available, but certainly it is unprecedented in terms of the, the, the open displays of um, kind of erratic behavior, particularly from the United States administration. But I think that there's also, in terms of the bigger picture, uh, another aspect which has to be considered, which is that the United States will, as quickly as possible, want to solidify or stabilize whatever process is, is now going to take place, because they already have their hands full, particularly in the Middle East, for example. And as you know, any, any kind of international relations theory will espouse, you, know, you do not want to open up two fronts simultaneously. So making things complex in the Far East on the Korean Peninsula would be highly undesirable for the United States in terms of the bigger picture. And they will want to solidify this so that they can refocus attention back to the Middle East. And Mr. Ober, do you think that the North Koreans want the same thing? What would happen next from the North Korean point of view? Well, you know, the North Koreans issued a surprisingly conciliatory statement after President Trump wrote his letter to Kim Jong-un. And it was very clever because it put the ball in the, back in the U.S. court. So I think a lot depends now actually on how Washington frames its criteria for getting back to a diplomatic process and getting back to the summit. Mr. Ku, if the ball is back in Washington's court, what do you think they could and should do next? Could we see Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo returning to Pyongyang? 
that's not something that I can really comment on. But certainly the South Korean government seems to feel that it's very important to get U.S. officials um, to continue staying committed to the process because um, you have to understand that Mr. Moon Jae-in, the president, was very recently in U.S. and um, the way it's been portrayed here in South Korea is that he was essentially dismissed by President Trump. That At some point, President Trump even actually said there's no need for interpretation because there's nothing really worth hearing from the South Korean side anymore. And this is a kind of story that is incredibly damaging to the image of the presidency here in South Korea. So the government has been um, trying to tell the public that it is engaging with the U.S. government. In fact, uh, Foreign Minister Kang kyung reportedly called Sta uh, Secretary of State Pompeo to make sure that U.S. is still on board with the peace process. And that's really the only thing that government here can hope for. The U.S. is genuine about wanting to have this summit, if not on June 12th, but sometime later down the road. And Mr. Mason, you know, does the summit being cancelled for now, does it mean that denuclearization is no longer an option? No, it doesn't mean that denuclearization is no longer an option. But what it, I think perhaps confirms is that both the North Korean side and, and the United States side disagree or at least don't come to any kind of um, comprehensive understanding on what that denuclearization means. Denuclearization itself is a very vague term, and I think this latest cancellation, apart from all of the other kind of um, hype and, and the comings and goings and the, and the tactics involved, highlights the fact that there is a fundamental understanding about the meaning of denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. And Mr. Oba, again, how do they bridge that, um, those fundamental differences in their understanding? Well, I think Washington really needs to be more flexible on this question. They need to recognize that complete denuclearization is something that's anathema to North Korea's basic interests in regime survival. And below that threshold, it's possible for the United States and North Korea to find common ground. Uh, but at this point, uh, it looks very difficult to bridge the gap on denuclearization. And the two countries are either going to have to lower expectations or find common ground on denuclearization if the summit is to proceed again. Mr. Koo, North Korea said that it dismantled its uh, only nuclear site on Thursday. What did you make of um, how that went, the fact that foreign journalists were there but international inspectors were not allowed? Did it show good faith or was it just um, symbolic rather than practical, do you think? Well, I'm sure you have heard the same reports I have that, in fact, um, there may be questions about actually the usability or utility of this nuclear testing site in the first place. And North Korea may not actually be losing much by closing it down. Um, it's also important to note that North Korea has made a symbolic gesture in the past, significantly the, um, the destruction of the cooling tower back in the 2000s once again at the time meant to show the world that it is serious about the denuclearization. Um, also, um, I don't know how much play this got in the foreign media, but certainly South Korean journalists had a significant difficulty in gaining access to the actual site. Uh, even a few days before the date of destruction, it wasn't clear whether they would be able to go. So those uh, things all raise questions about the sincerity of North Korea, certainly. But at the same time, it is true that North Korea did promise to proceed with this um, destruction of the testing site between the 23rd and 25th. And that is precisely what it has done. So, yes, I think you can say um, it is not the most convincing sign we can hope for. But it is certainly a very important gesture that should not be overlooked. And as well as... Um as well as the dismantling of uh, that nuclear site. Mr. Mason, we of course also had the freeing of American, American prisoners that were being held in North Korea. Do you think that the United States has returned these goodwill gestures at all? I think it's hard to see how they've returned these goodwill gestures, but I think perhaps one of the kind of uh, undercurrents to this is the United States seeking to demonstrate its superior position from, from the start of any potential negotiations. And what I mean by that is simply that it frames these, um, these ongoing movements as 
conciliatory in the sense that it allows the North Koreans um, to the to the negotiating table. And that in itself is being portrayed as a goodwill gesture, whereas the North Koreans have to make these very tangible gestures, such as the destruction of the, of the nuclear test sites of the, or of the release of the prisoners, that these very kind of specific tangible steps have to be taken. And in return, the goodwill gesture from the United States side is simply to actually sit at the table. I think the United States is trying to consolidate that position and very much be it explicit or implicit, pass that message to the North Korean negotiating team. Mr. Ober, what did you make of the fact that this White House, you know, minted dozens of commem commemorative coins ahead of the summit, embossed with the words peace talks and with the headshots of Trump and Kim before it had even taken place? Well, I think it speaks to the exceptional focus on image that President Trump and his administration have. Uh, we saw reports in recent days that President Trump wasn't really focusing on the details of denuclearization or uh, more of these technical or policy questions. He was focused on the optics. And I think the minting of all these commemorative coins really speaks to that. Mr. Ku, what do you make of uh, these coins and what happens to them now? And are they in any way indicative of um, the seeming dysfunction sometimes in this White House? Yes, um, I've also read reports saying that perhaps the White House has had not much of an influence over the minting of these commemorative coins. It might even have been simply done by um, a routine matter uh, by a different branch of the government. This is something I cannot really speak on. But I think um, within South Korea, there is certainly a feeling that it's difficult to say sometimes what Washington is really looking to achieve. On one hand, with Mr. Trump saying nice things about North Korea and its conciliatory gestures, but at the same time, the appointment of hardliners, including the new U.S. ambassador to South Korea, who is known to have very strong opinions on North Korea as well as China. So there's a lot of guessing game going on here, and certainly minting of this coin is part of that. Uh, we don't have very long left in the program, and I would like to ask each of you um, a very quick last question, which is just how hopeful are you that the progress that had been made in the last few months will not um, go to waste? I'll start with you, Mr. Mason. Well, I am hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful because I think ultimately the North Koreans want it. And I think although the American strategy is less clear, I think as you, we heard there in terms of the comments about image, for Donald Trump, um, an unprecedented summit would be something that, if you like, he can put on his CV, on his next election CV, and, and leave his kind of legacy, stamp his or his legacy, quite literally in the case of the coins, um, but on something which is unprecedented and striking. So I, I am still hopeful that ultimately we can see North Korea and the United States return to the or begin the negotiating process, if you like, at that negotiating table. Mr. Ober? Well, you know, I, I feel like I'm in a state of perpetual cautious optimism on North Korea. I think that uh, the United States and North Korea can find common ground and that President Trump and Kim Jong-un both have a stake now in uh, getting some sort of diplomatic victory. Uh, so I hope that they'll be able to, to translate this into, into progress. And Mr. Ku, are you as cautiously optimistic, would you say? I would say I share the optimism uh, much more so now than I did it last night. Uh, I think uh, there have been many skeptics who have been questioning North Korea's motive. They have said, well, maybe this is another tactic by the regime to try and delay uh, more sanctions so that it can continue to have time to develop nuclear arms. Um, after the cancellation of the summit, I was wondering whether North Korea would react angrily as it often does. But the fact that it has shown quite a bit of restraint and also um, diplomatic uh, impulses really goes to show that it is serious about diplomacy and it is serious about denuclearization as long as conditions can be met. Thank you very much for that. That is uh, Mentaro Oba in Washington, D.C., Ra Mason in Norwich and Si Wong Koo in Seoul.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Elizabeth Peranum, and the whole team here. Bye for now.